like to welcome you to the Church History Library's Men and Women of Faith. Um, our tonight's lecture is entitled Faith and the Coming Forth of the Book of Mormon, presented by Bill Slaughter. I'm April Williamson. I'm in charge of public programming for the Church History Library, and I'd like to welcome you all here this evening for our lecture. Uh, tonight, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about Bill. Uh, he grew up an army brat, ending up in El Paso, Texas. It was there that he was introduced to and joined the church. Bill received his bachelor's degree in political science and his master's degree in library science from Brigham Young University. He currently is a photograph, a photograph archivist and consultation archivist at the Church History Library. He has authored or co-authored uh, a number of books, um, including Joseph Smith's America, Prophets of the Latter Days, How We Got the Book of Mormon, Life in Zion, Trail of Hope, 40 Ways to Look at Brigham Young, and Camping Out in the Yellowstone, 1882. Bill is an active individual. He enjoys sports, um, the out of doors, including hiking, backpacking, bicycle riding. Uh, he has participated in the Loda Jaw for the last several years. Uh, he currently lives in Salt Lake with his wife, Sherry, and they are the parents of two children. I have known Bill for over 20 years. Uh, he's a great friend. He's been a great mentor to me over the years. Um, he's my sounding board. When I have uh, frustrations, he's the one that I usually take them out on, and he's very good to sit and listen to me. I've appreciated his friendship over the years, and I'm extremely pleased this evening that we have him to speak to us, and I know you will be too. So without any further words, we'll turn the time over to Bill. Okay. I'm going to take a drink of water because I already have dry mouth. Um, I do hope, well, let me, let me set the rules for tonight. This is not going to be a deep analysis of the Book of Mormon or textual changes, but it is the story of how the first edition of the Book of Mormon came about. And it's, it's about the faith of people. And often when I'm, when I'm going through the story, uh, we'll note individuals. And I want, to think, I want you to think about it, the faith it took for them to take this leap uh, into something quite extraordinary. Excuse me. Um, okay, as Mormons, we kind of assume the Book of Mormon. We assume, of course, the Book of Mormon, it's the keystone of our religion, and we accept it, but I don't think we often ponder what it took to get this uh, book translated, published, uh, and read. It is, but it took faith to bring forth the Book of Mormon when it was assumed the Word of God was closed, that there would be no additional scripture, and that revelation was a thing of the distant past. You know, growing up in the 60s, I was born in 1952, confession here, and being an army brat, World War II was uh, often talked about, but I thought it was ancient history. And when my parents talked about my dad's, my dad didn't go over to Europe. He didn't go to the Pacific. He, to much to my chagrin, was on the coastal watch. I thought, that's not a big deal. Well, it's because I assumed that we were going, and I, th I thought they assumed that they were going to win the war. Why would they need that? Well, one day, one, a few years ago, Sherry and I, my wife, went out to Fort Lewis, Delaware, and saw the Coastal Watch, the towers, the, the gun placements, and also they had a couple articles which uh, talked about my dad and the work they were doing. And I came to realize, you know, that generation did not assume they were going to win the war. And so when, we talk, when I talk about assuming the Book of Mormon, it wasn't a given. Um, it was an adventure, and an adventure isn't always good, it isn't always bad, but it is the unexpected. It was an adventure of faith, action, doubt, testing of faith, trials, and perseverance. And we're going to, as I go through this, I want you to 
note the time, the many trials that Joseph and, and his, and Oliver and Mart, uh, Martin Harris and others have. Now, what is faith? I read from Alma 32, 21. Faith is not to have perfect knowledge of things. Therefore, if ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. And I want to paraphrase Marcus, uh, Elder Marcus Nash, uh, who spoke here, spoke these words, but back in February. He said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, faith is rooted in confidence and unqualified trust in Christ, hope. Faith is an anchor to our soul coupled with a desire to believe. Faith allows us to experiment upon the word and the will of God. We act upon our belief before we see. Faith allows us to endure trials. It's my contention that such was the case with Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Emma Smith, Lucy Mack Smith, Martin Harris, Joseph Knight, David Whitmer. And the Book of Mormon has positively changed in the lives of millions. Uh, in the beginning, lives like Brigham Young, Heber Kimball, Philae Kimball, Marianne Angel Young. Now, I want to give a context of time. And the time that uh, of America, the first thing I want to mention is the Second Great Awakening, which was taking place in the, late, in the early 1800s. There was, obviously, since there was a Second Great Awakening, there must have been a First Great Awakening. And that was in 1740s within established congregations. And it, it taught redemption by warning of terrors of hell and avoiding the wrath of God. The Second Great Awakening was in the early, as I said, early 1800s. And it took places in churches, frontier camps, um, houses, anywhere people would get together. And it made a almost what I would consider a revolutionary change in how we look at the relationship with divinity. This general Second Great Awakening taught mankind's active role in drawing close to God. Universal salvation replaced the fate of predestination. Now, as April said, I'm a convert to the church. And even as a young well, not so young, as a teenager and a young college student, the one thing that stood out to me about Joseph Smith and the Mormon religion was this idea of hope, that it is the positive relationships we can have with our Savior versus the fear of retribution of God, the fear of a negative relationship with God, the fear of the terror of hell. Instead, it's a, it's a positive force. Excuse me again. Now, some things, other things took place in the history of uh, religion. And I'm sorry these are out of order, but bear with me. William, in uh, the 16th century, this, this sets up the, you know, I'm supposed to be changing these things, aren't I? Forgive me. There's a cool picture. First edition of the Book of Mormon and a great painting of uh, our prophet Joseph Smith. Um, the Great Awakening, this is a, a picture from the period which shows uh, uh, they got pretty worked up. Um, and the camp meetings would go, go on for weeks, uh, for days, I mean. It could last up to uh, several weeks. It wasn't just a day, it wasn't only a day long thing. Now, William Tinsdale, uh, he was an English religious reformer in the 16th century who published the first English translation of the New Testament, was, uh, had to hightail it to Germany to hide out from the authorities. But he is credited with saying, if God preserves my life, I will cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more about the scriptures than the Pope. Jonathan Edwards, who was an American theologian and uh, had some negative attributes, but he, uh, he did understand that the latter-day glory is probably to begin in America. Now, this played to a feeling throughout that America, among young America, that 
America was a special place. It was a place ordained of God. Things, great things would happen. Ralph Waldo Emerson, a little bit out of date, but in 18, he was talking to the Harvard Divinity School, the one and only time he was invited. And he proclaimed the established churches had strayed from Christ's teachings and that new revelation was needed to understand God. All these suggest a culture which allowed for people to ponder, pray, and seek. Also, remember that Joseph Smith's America was a young America, inventing itself in science, religion, commerce, education, art, literature, and social causes. Lord does not work haphazardly. Meaningful, timely questions are answered when they have the context for them to be um, absorbed and understood. Uh, one thing, to the great, uh, there's the Greek, ancient Greeks talked about two ways of, t had two concepts of time. Kronos, which is the day to day, month to month, march of time. The others, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, is kreos, and that is things happening in a timely manner when they would be most understood. Um, the opportune time or the right time for something to happen in the appropriate measure, thus enabling a wholeness, the perfect now in which events have meaning, meaning such was America prior to the Civil War. Now, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon was a staggering achievement. It was for, jo for Joseph to bring about. The mere fact that it exists is more, than a mer more of a miracle than many of us realize. The adventure began with a 12-year-old boy asking questions about the plight of the world and his soul. Then that same boy at the age of 14 prayed as suggested in James 1.5, ask and receive. Well, he got more than he expected or bargained for. A boy who probably thought he would live his life as a farmer would go on to change many, the whole, change the religious face of the world. I want to, now I'm going to, ask forgiveness for, as Elder Nash did, for reading this next part. But I wrote it, we wrote it, Rick Turley and I, and I want to get it right. Um, I'm a writer, not a speaker. Um, this comes from our book, um, How We Got the Book of Mormon. Uh, and I appreciate, I want to thank, by the way, Rick Turley for allow me to work on this book with him. And what I'm about to relate are things that we learned in the process of writing this book. So, putting on my glasses. On September 22nd, 1823, a 17-year-old boy named Joseph Smith went to the tallest hill near his home in upstate New York. He was led there by the instructions of an angel who had visited him three times in his bedroom the night before and a fourth time that morning near the field where he was working with his father and brothers. On the west side of the hill, near the top, he found a large stone. Prying it up, he peered down into the stone, inside on a platform of crossways, ro crossways rocks lay a rack of golden metal plates or sheets linked with three rings into a book. There, beside them, lay two stones in silver like old-fashioned spectacles. The angel had told him the purpose of the plates was to glorify God, not to get rich. But remember, Joseph's family was poor. They were struggling to buy their own farm and needed the money they could, any money they could get. Maybe, Joseph thought, there was something in the box they could use. He reached in only to be thrown back by a sudden shock. Moroni, the angel Joseph had seen in the recent visions, appeared again, forbidding him to take the objects just yet. Joseph needed training first to assure that he would see them as sacred to God's purposes, not as treasures to be used for worldly gain. Four years later, to the day, not long after midnight, a more mature Joseph returned to the hill in a borrowed wagon, his new bride Emma at his side. 
She waited below while he received the plates. Moroni delivered him this charge, that I should be responsible for them, Joseph wrote, that I should let them go carelessly or through neglect of mine, I should be cut off, but that if I would use, them all, use all my endeavors to preserve them until he, the messenger, should call again, they, would be, they should be protected. Joseph kept the plates for nearly, well, less than two years, before returning them to Moroni. During that time, he came to know the ancient records well. These records were engraven on plates which had the appearance of gold, he wrote in 1842. Each plate was six inches wide and eight inches long and not quite thick as common tin. They were filled with engravings in Egyptian characters and bound together in a volume as the leaves of a book with three rings running through the whole. The volume was something near six inches in thickness, part of which was sealed. A friend of the Smiths, a respectable man and farmer named Martin Harris, he thought that the rings were silver. He wrote that he thought the rings were silver and that the whole record weighed 40 or 50 pounds. Another friend, David Whitmer, also saw the ancient records, saying that the sealed portion made up of half or two thirds of the volume. Emma never saw the plates without their being wrapped in linen. But they often sat on the table where the Smiths lived, and she moved them around as she did her housework. I once felt of the plates, and as they lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape, they seemed to, to be pliable like thick paper and would rustle with a metallic sound when the edges were moved with thumb. The reformed Egyptian language of the plates. Hold, I do want to say something about Emma. Now, like with Joseph, Emma, I, I don't think Emma had any idea what she was getting into. But her faith and her belief in Joseph's um, claim that he was working for God and in the name of God she, I don't know what their day-to-day -day life was like, but she stuck with him through uh, tarring and feathering, being hated by many, being loved by some. I, I just cannot imagine what life was like her, for her on a day-to-day -day basis, knowing that your husband has been called of God and his life was, frankly, constantly in danger. And... And on the other end, he was adored by many. And I, my heart goes out to Emma Smith. I think, uh, I think Joseph uh, was very lucky to have her as a wife. The Reformed Egyptian language of the plates had both Egyptian and Hebrew traits. In 1839, Joseph said the wording of the record's title page came from the very last leaf on the left side of the collection of books. Now, I'm not going to go through all the technicalities because I want to talk a little bit about the adventure. There's our man, Martin Harris. This picture was taken after he came to Utah. This is probably, what do we say, about 1870, 72. He was born in the late, well, he was born in 1783, so he was, he was fairly old when he returned to the church. Interesting enough, he shows up to the church, goes to the tabernacle, and Brigham Young dresses him down for having faltered in his faith, but, but he did come back. After Joseph received the place from Moroni, persecution drove him and Emma to her parents' neighborhood in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Martin Harris gave the young couple $50, a goodly amount of money, to help them move. To protect the plates, Joseph hid them in a barrel of beans during the 140-mile journey. When Joseph got to Pennsylvania in December 1827, he copied some characters from the plates and translated part of, part of them. In February of the next year, he gave a sheet of this work to Martin Harris, who took it to New York and showed it to scholars. Of course, we know what happens. Um, they stated, I cannot read a sealed book, a professor scoffed. In April, Martin Returned to Harmony, convinced he should serve as a scribe while Joseph dictated the translation of the Golden Record. 
During the time Joseph had the plate, several people watched him translate. They said that rather look at, than looking at the record itself, he looked into the interpreter's or another seer stone, blocking out internal, external light, such as by placing the interpreters in his hat and putting his face down into it. Joseph himself, however, refused to elaborate on the process, a process that he considered sacred. He said that it was not intended to tell the world all the particulars of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. He said simply that he translated by the gift and power of God. In other words, the translation came by revelation. Joseph could not read the language on the golden plates by himself. He needed God's help. With that help, he could translate, even if he wasn't looking directly at the record. Now, here's a, a, here's a trial and something that... Uh, Joseph would have to deal with and worry about. Martin arrived in Harmony, Pennsylvania around April 12, 1828 to act as Joseph's scribe for the plates. By June 14th, the men had filled 116 pages with a translation of the book of Lehi and perhaps part of the book of Mosiah. Soon, Joseph wrote, Martin began to tease me to give me liberty to carry the writings home and show them to people there. Martin hoped to convince them of the truth. Joseph prayed to know if, Joseph, if Martin should take the pages. And what did the Lord say? He kept telling him no. Until finally, Joseph asked repeatedly, and this time permission was granted, provided Martin showed the pages to only five family members. On June 15th, after Martin had left for New York, Joseph's wife, Emma, gave birth to their first child. So all this is going on. Now they're, they're having a child. The newborn son soon died, and Emma seemed for some time more like sinking with her infant into the mansion of the dead than remaining with her husband among the living. For two weeks, Joseph slept not an hour in undisturbed quiet as he cared for Emma, when she finally began to mend, another cause of trouble forced itself upon his mind. Martin had gone, been gone almost three weeks and no word from him. Joseph didn't want to ag agitate Emma as she healed and said nothing to her, and he said nothing to her about his worries. A few days later, however, she asked him to get her mother to care for her so he could go to Palmyra and figure out what was wrong. Joseph caught the first stagecoach towards Palmyra, had time to think about what was going on. He knew that if Martin had lost the pages, he, Joseph, could not recover the translation without God's help. And that was something Joseph could hardly hope for, because by persisting in his entreaties to God, he may have sinned. Despite utter exhaustion, sleep fled Despite, yeah, sleep fled from my eyes, and neither had he any desire for food, for he had felt he had done wrong, and how great his condemnation he did not know. After arriving at his parents' house, he asked his parents to send for Martin, which they did immediately. Martin, who usually came quickly when called, did not show up, did not arrive as expected. They waited and waited, and finally at 12.30, they saw him walking with a slow, measured tread towards the house, looking down the whole time. Martin sat on the fence for a while before coming in to sit at the table. He took up his knife and fork as if he were going to use them, but immediately dropped them. Joseph's brother Hiram asked Martin if he was sick, and Martin began pressing his hands to his temples, crying, Oh, I have lost my soul. I have lost my soul. Joseph tried to stay calm, but exclaimed, Martin, have you lost the manuscript? Have you broken your oath, brought down condemnation upon my head as well as yours? Martin confessed, yes, it is gone, and I know not where. Joseph could hardly be consoled, worrying about that the stressful news might kill the weakened Emma when he told her, and how shall I appear before the Lord, he asked. Of what rebuke 
Am I not worthy from the angel of the Most High? Joseph wept, grieved, paced the floor. The next day he started for home. We parted with heavy hearts, his mother wrote, for it now appeared that all which he had so fondly anticipated and which, he, which had been the source of so much secret gratification had in a moment fled and fled forever. Martin had broken his promise. The 160 manuscript pages had disappeared. He suffered temporarily, he suffered temporally as well as spiritually for the lost. Some of his crops failed and he experienced deep, deep anguish. Joseph wrote, I was so chastened, taken from me for a season. The plates were taken from me for a season. Joseph returned to harmony and after a time of sore repentance, he received the plates again, but he still needed someone to write the, as he dictated. And that man appeared. Oliver Cowdery. Oliver Cowdery is one of our heroes. Yes, he left the church for a while, but he did come back just before he died. Uh, he was a man at the right time. And what a leap of faith to, to hope and to work on, hope that this is scripture and to work with Joseph hand in hand on this. On April 5th, 1829, Oliver Cowdery arrived in Harmony. Brought by spiritual impressions and Joseph's brother Samuel, Oliver had been teaching school and boarding with Joseph's parents when he learned about the golden plates. He was the full-time scribe Joseph needed. On Monday, April 6th, the next day, Joseph and Emma closed on the home where they'd been living, which they bought from Emma's brother. On Tuesday, Joseph and Oliver began translating the plates in earnest. From that point on, Oliver was the principal scribe for the translation, though others stepped in from time to time. The pace of the translation was stunning, about eight pages a day, remarkable for even skilled translators. Day after day, I continued uninterrupted to write from his mouth, Oliver Cowdery wrote. They probably began that portion of Mosiah that Joseph still had and continued to the end of Moroni, then moved to the small plates of Nephi, finishing at the words of Mormon. The translation of the small plates covered the same time period as the lost 116 pages, but from a spiritual point of view rather than a historical perspective. By the end of June, by the end of June, the translation was complete. In early June, Oliver's friend David Whitmer came down to Harmony from Fayette, New York with a two-horse wagon. He took Joseph and Oliver back to the home of David's parents, Peter and Mary Whitmer, so that the men could finish the translation without worries about supporting themselves or increasing persecution where they had been living. Je Emma soon joined them, by the way. Mary Whitmer felt burdened by the extra person staying with her family. When she went out to milk cows one evening, she ran into a man who explained the important work being done in her home. He untied a knapsack and showed her the golden plates before vanishing. Thereafter, Mary's household duties were easier, seemed easier. As Joseph translated the record and received additional revelation, he learned God would grant special witness, three in particular, the privilege to see and verify the plates, Oliver, Martin and David Whitmer were asked if they could, could be the three Joseph prayed and received direction that they should be the ones. Later near the Whitmer home, Oliver, David and Martin were shown the plates, the interpreters and other sacred objects. They testified that an angel of God came from heaven and he bought, brought and laid down before our eyes that we beheld and saw the plates and engravings thereon. They also heard God's voice declare that they had been translated by the gift and power of God. Not long after this time in the woods near his parents' homes, Joseph showed the plates to his father, his brother Hiram and Samuel, David Whitmer's four brothers, and their brother-in-law Hiram Page. The eight men testified that they had seen and hefted and know for a sure, of a surety that the said smith 
has got the plates of which he, we have spoken. After these witnesses returned to the house, Joseph's mother said, the angel again made his appearance, at which time Joseph delivered up the plates into the angel's hands. He had fulfilled the charge he had received and could breathe a sigh of relief that the plates were safely out of his hands and that others could bear witness. Future generations tried mightily to explain how largely untutored youth could dictate a complex record of nearly 500 manuscript pages in a single draft over fewer than 90 working days. Millions have accepted Joseph's explanation as the possible, only plausible one, that he did it by the gift and power of God. Now, translated, he's got to get him published, which brings even more trials and tests of faith. Joseph first had to secure a copyright. That is the, co the copy of the copyright. Joseph thus turned to publishing the Book of Mormon even before he finished the translation. On June 11th, 1829, he took a break from translating and visited the federal court for the Northern District of New York. There he applied for a copyright to the Book of Mormon, depositing a printed copy of the title page he had bought, brought with him. Now, federal law granted copywriters copyrights to authors and proprietors, and the term authors included translators. The court clerk dutifully filled out the copyright certificate, copying information onto it from the title page of the Book of Mormon. He entered a copy of the certificate in a bound register for future reference before giving the document to Joseph. Now, around the same time, Joseph began looking for a publisher, which proved very challenging. He went to Egbert B. Grandin, the young, young printer in Palmyra, New York, where, near, where Joseph's parents lived. Together, Grandin and his friend Luther Howard ran a three-story business on Main Street. Grandin printed pages on the third story, lowered them down to Howard, who bound them in his second-story shop. They then sold the books on the first-story bookstore. Printing, in the, printing the Book of Mormon in Palmyra was Joseph's first choice. Um, he planned to go back to Harmony to, to live with Emma in their new home, leaving Oliver, Martin, and Hiram to oversee the printing. Oliver could stay with the Smiths, who lived outside, just south of the uh, Palmyra village. Joseph and Martin, next, uh, after they talked with Grandin and um, talked about what he wanted to do, they then went to Rochester, New York, which was more than 20 miles away. Rochester was a fast-growing Erie Canal city. Uh, he'd hoped to find someone open-minded and ambitious, and ambitious enough to take on the project. Turned down twice, they finally found a Rochester publisher willing to print the book. Before signing a contract with him, however, the men decided to return to Grandin and give it one more try. Grandin had two concerns, one, he doubted the book would sell well enough to cover his cost and turn a profit. The project was big for a young country printer, and he wasn't eager to tie up his equipment on a losing proposition. Second, not all of his neighbors were enthusiastic about the Book of Mormon, and he didn't want to disappoint them or make them think he bought into this newfangled faith in any way. Martin Harris solved the first problem by agreeing to mortgage his farm. Did I get that? He mortgaged his farm to assure that Grandin would be paid. And passing up the offer wouldn't stop the book from being printed, Joseph and Martin pointed out, since a Rochester publisher was willing to print it. Not, when he, not wanting to lose money and a profit, Grandin counseled with his friends who agreed that his printing, book, his printing of the book, as long as he did, not strictly, he did it for strictly business reasons. The contract called for Carandon to print 500 copies of 3000 for $3,000, a large print order for its day. Grandin went to work advertising for help in his print shop and ordering a new type of font. He would need a lot of metal type for his job. Meanwhile, Joseph made preparations. First, he asked Oliver to make a copy of the whole manuscript of the Book of Mormon 
After losing 116 pages, Joseph didn't want to risk losing pages again. And remember, this had to be laboriously done. There's no Xerox machine. There's no photographing it. There's no emailing it. They have to laboriously work out of this hand with a hand. Second, he charged Oliver to take only one copy of the manuscript to the printer at a time so that if one copy should be destroyed, there will be a copy remaining. Third, he said that in going to and from the office, Oliver should always have a guard to attend him to protect the manuscript. Finally, he directed that a guard keep watch over the house both day and night to keep malicious persons from coming in and destroying the manuscript. At that, Joseph returned to, to Pennsylvania. It took Oliver, Hiram, and other scribes more time to copy the manuscript than it took Joseph to dictate it. That was partly because Joseph and Hiram had other duties to perform. They worked hard to stay ahead of the printer, but at one point, the printing had gotten ahead of the copying, and the original manuscript instead of the copy was used to set type of the printed book. The printing job was reportedly the largest ever done in the country, and both Grandin and Howard had to be ta take on extra help to do this job. Grandin invited an experienced printer named John Gilbert to set type for the Book of Mormon. According to Gilbert, who's in this picture, when Grandin was ready to start the printing, he notified Martin Harris, who lived nearby. Martin got word to the Smith family, and Hiram carried the 24 pages of the manuscript to the print shop. Gilbert remembered that when Hiram walked to the shop, he had part of the manuscript under his vest with his vest coat buttoned over it. That night, Hiram retrieved the pages and then took them home, repeating the routine with the same fastness the next morning. Watchfulness, excuse me. The manuscript remained safe, just as Joseph had hoped. But soon after, a problem arose. The printers set shop to create large sheets of 16 pages each that would later be folded, bound, and trimmed to form books. After printing 5,000 copies of the first sheet, they set them aside and set type for the second 16 pages. It took from August 1829 to March 1830 to print the nearly 3 million pages needed for the first edition of the Book of Mormon. Now, another pros and a, a, a problem arose uh, because Grandin allowed his friend, Abner Cole, to use his print shop at nights and on Sundays when Grandin own, Grandin's own employees were away. Cole published a small town newspaper called The Reflector that he used to poke fun at, other, for, at others under his pen named Obadiah Dogberry. As Cole was working in the print shop, he noticed the uncut sheets of the Book of Mormon waiting for binding and decided to pirate the book in his paper. In his last issue of the paper, December 1829, he published a teaser, Golden Bible, next week, which let his readers know the plan. Oliver and Hiram confronted Cole about his wrongdoing one Sunday morning at the print shop. Mr. Cole, Hiram said, what right have you to print the Book of Mormon in this manner? Do you not know that we have secured the copyright? It is none of your business, Cole replied. I have hired the press and will print as I please. The more Hiram tried to dissuade him, the angrier Cole got. Hiram finally went home and consulted with his father, who said Joseph needed to know about the problem. Going to the print shop, Joseph approached Cole about his piracy. Cole took off his coat and went at Joseph pounding his fists together, yelling, do you want to fight, sir? Do you want to fight? I will publish just as I please. Now, if you want to fight, come on. Joseph calmly assured the agitated man he did not want to fight and then quietly added, Mr. Cole, there is a law. You will find out if you do not understand it now. At that point, point Cole cooled down and finally agreed to submit a mat to the matter to arbitration. He was ultimately ordered to stop this unethical activity and did so. Cole's piracy, however, cost him at least one subscription. On March 11th, Luther Howard, the binder of for the Book of Mormon, wrote to Cole, when the present series of the reflector is completed, you will please erase my name from your list of subscribers. Finally, on March 26, 1830, a notice appeared in Grandin's own newspaper, the Wayne Sentinel. 
it reproduced the information of the title page and announced the above work containing about 600 pages is now for sale, wholesale and retail, at the Palmyra store. At last, the Book of Mormon was available to the public in an authorized form. Despite the book's notoriety, people in Palmyra area were resolved to boycott its sale. The volume sold for $1.75 a copy, but few, very few people bought it, and the price soon dropped to $1.25. Martin Harris tried selling copies and was grieved when they wouldn't sell. He asked Joseph for a revelation on the subject, and Joseph received one, commanding Martin, Thou shalt not covet thine own property, but impart it freely to the printing of the Book of Mormon. A year after the book was released, it, hadn't sold, it had not sold enough to cover the printing cost. Martin fulfilled the commandment that he had received, and on, March, on April 7, 1831, he sold 150 acres of his farm for $3,000. On January 28, 1832, uh, the man he sold it to, Thomas Lackley, sold the property for $3,300 to keep, keeping $300 and giving Martin $3,000 he needed to, for his obligation. Surely, Martin, Martin's sacrifice had made it possible for the Book of Mormon to, be, to, to allow the Book of Mormon to go out to the world. Now, gave you a lot of information, a lot of story. It was, imagine living that day to day. Now I'm gonna, if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna, I'm going to discuss, I'm gonna quote Jack Welsh, a BYU scholar, and it's gonna, he did a very good job in doing a rundown on this, so forgive me for doing this again, but I'm, but, well, for reading, but we're gonna go through it quickly. Jack Welsh states, consider for example the simple question, simple question how long it took Joseph to translate the Book of Mormon. Many solid and independent historical records written by people like Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph Knife, David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, and even public records like the mortgage on Martin Harris's farm thoroughly corroborate the, deal, the details and reveal the amazing story. After setbacks of 1828, the translation of the Book of Mormon finally began on April 7th, 1829. Okay? April 7th, 1829, two days after Joseph excuse me, two days after Oliver Cowdery arrived in Harmony, guided by personal revelation from the Lord, he became Joseph's scribe. A short five weeks later, five weeks later, May 15th, 1829, they had already reached the account of Christ's ministry among the Nephites in 3 Nephi 11. A month later, June 11th, we know they had translated the last of the plates of Mormon for Joseph used the words from the title page as a legal description on the copyright application he filed that day. By June 30th, end of the month, the job was finished at the Whitmer farmhouse in Fayette, New York. New York. Now, from start to, to finish, no more than 85, took no more than 85 total days. But even from that must be subtracted some time and disruption when Joseph and Oliver moved the first week in June in a buckboard from Harmony to Fayette, some 120 miles or so away. Time the trips to Colville for supplies, 60 miles round trip. Time to receive and record 13 sections now contained in the Doctrine and Covenants. Time to restore the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods. Time to convert and baptize Samuel and Hiram Smith and several others. Time to experience manifestations with the three and eight witnesses, and I suppose a little time to eat and sleep. This leaves about 60 to 65 days on which the prophet could have worked on the translation. That's about the length of, of a spring term in college. This works out to a phenomenal average of eight or nine pages per day, day in, day out. Only a week to produce First Nephi with all its subtle religious and cultural baggage that Hugh Nibley has taken volumes to unpack. It took a, half, a day and a half to translate, this is, this is powerful, it took a day and a half to translate King Benjamin's speech, one of the most masterful texts anywhere in religious literature, 
Besides teaching doctrines about the atonement, service, humility, conversion, and covenants, the speech also reflects ancient Israelite piety infused with the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet there was no time for Joseph to consult a library. Matter of fact, there wasn't a library near. There was no time to study to find out, in fact, that Israelite kings delivered covenant renewal speeches like Benjamin's from towers to their people who gathered by families in tents around the temple. There was no time to revise, refine, to cross-check, entangle dates or interwoven details. Instead, the text came, as Oliver recorded five years later, day after day, uninterrupted, as the words fell from his mouth. Jack Welsh goes on to say, this, seeing this has brought home to me the magnificent magnificence of the text of the Book of Mormon. This was an astonishing achievement. The text came one time through. The final copy was dictated, and thus it stood, except for minor stylistic editing to this day. As a lawyer, meaning Jack Welsh, as a lawyer, I know what it is to dictate. After years of practice, I still not, ca cannot count on dictating anything perfectly the first time. There's the title page of the first Book of Mormon. I'm going to give uh, just short words about some of the people who were affected by the Mo Book of Mormon. And I would imagine many of us were affected by the Book of Mormon. I know it changed my life. I wouldn't be standing here in front of you if I had not read it and been moved to change my life. Lucy Mack Smith. Now, this she was she supported Joseph right from the beginning. Now, we've put this in here because... That's her Book of Mormon. That's her in a painting, and she's holding that Book of Mormon. Bathsheba W. Smith, who was, uh, as you know, was a stalwart in the church here and back, I mean, in Nauvoo and, and here in the West. When I heard the gospel, I knew it was true. When I first heard the Book of Mormon, I knew it was inspired of God. When I first beheld Joseph Smith, I knew I stood face to face with the prophet of the living God and no doubt in my mind about his authority. Uh, several women, uh, Vienna Jacks gave of her, gave to the publishing and, and of the Book of Mormon, Valet Kimball, uh, wife of Heber C. Kimball. We all know Eliza R. Snow and her poetry and her great sacrifices. Marianne Angel Young, wife of Brigham Young, is little known today but she's a woman of great faith and was very respected by the community. And it was her brother who uh, designed the Salt Lake Temple. Uh, she's often not given credit uh, as much credit as she should have. Now, Wilford Woodruff recorded uh, in 1841 Joseph Smith's word about the Book of Mormon. Joseph said that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion that a man could not uh, by living could not better live according to God's dictates than if than by any other book Brigham Young um, now think about Brigham Young he's 30 years old when he converts his life is already pretty much set he can he's a carpenter he's a Man, a jack of all trades. And then this book comes to him, and he takes a year to ponder it, study it, and he showed the faith to change his life and in a, a very inconveniently. Now, faith was his cornerstone, was the cornerstone of his life, and it would dictate his actions to the day he died. Now, in conclusion, I want to read, because Joseph pondered a question prayed with faith, received an answer, and acted on and endured, and endured with faith. Like a warm spring breeze after a long, cold summer, Joseph Smith brought the world renewed hope. For those who heard and understood, the message he gave soothed their souls, much like the sweet warmth of the sun. The head and the heart, the finite and the infinite, the earthly and the heavenly were once again united. The potential for happiness and the positive divine nature of mankind was once again brought to the forefront. 
In the Book of Mormon are the words that underlies the Lord's plan and stand in stark contrast to the ages of dark emphasis on fearing God. Men are that they might have joy. Given the hope Joseph Smith brought to the world, it is hardly surprising that Brigham Young gushed. I feel like shouting hallelujah all the time when I think that I ever knew Joseph Smith the prophet. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Ah. Questions? My great-grandfather, Edward Stevenson, was the one that brought Martin Harris West and rebaptized him. On his way back, uh, I just found out that Martin Harris revealed to Edward that the sealed portion was sealed by other rings. So there are places where there are rings on both sides to seal them. I'd never known that. Thank you. I, 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 did, I need to point out something. David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses, uh, never came back to the church. But uh, later in life, uh, a pamphlet was printed that gave his testimony to the Book of Mormon. He never, never changed his mind about the Book of Mormon. His, he had other issues, as they say. My name is uh, Glenn Larson. Uh, I thought you did a wonderful job in presenting the, what Joseph Smith did in putting the Book of Mormon together, but what evidence do you have that after the Book of Mormon was put together that he used it in his teachings? Wow. Um, he refers to it quite a bit. Um, I don't see any real evidence of him teaching from the Book of Mormon and using uh, it. I think that's a good point. I, matter of fact, while we did this, we did this book, um, and, uh, and in preparing for this, I actually came up with the same question. Um, and I don't know how to reply to that, except he does talk about the Book of Mormon throughout his life and, re, and does refer to different passages. And he's also the one who has to approve the second edition and then the Liverpool edition. And he he's very concerned about uh, when Brigham Young and the others want to publish it in England, he's very concerned that it is done correctly and precisely as he uh, translated it. And uh, so I think he probably referred, I mean, he had a lot going on. Um, so I don't know that it was noted every time he used, referred to the Book of Mormon. But he did say it was the keystone of our religion, period. Um, just as you were going along the timeline, I had a question. Um, at the Hill Cumorah, I, I went there a few years ago. I didn't think of this at the time, but do we know the location of where the plates were? And the rock or a cement box? People, do we know uh, anything about that? I have to admit this, but I've never been there. I've only seen it through great photographs. And I'm going to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm sure people have tried to find it, but uh, I don't think it was, I don't think it was meant to be. That's the best I can answer you. What was Mary Young's role? You said she was, is forgotten now, but what did Mary Angel Young, Mary Ann Angel Young do to make her so renowned back in the well, in Salt Lake Central. City, right? Yeah, I think she was um, what April would call a sounding board to many women. She was quiet, unassuming, yet her opinion, when she, when she spoke, others listened to her. Um, she was not gifted with poetry. She was not gifted with letter writing that we know of. Um, but the women felt she was a source of strength, faith, and honesty, and somebody, again, I'm going to repeat, it's very important for people to have a sounding board, and that she was one of those people who would not uh, speak quickly, but speak deeply. And I, and I think she's, she's sort of forgotten there, um, and uh, I think she needs to be appreciated. And she took a leap, too, and I, you know, and you think her brother um, was chosen to of course, you can call this nepotism, too, can't you? To uh, design the uh, Salt Lake Temple. That's, 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 that's how it's changed. I mean, these people were doing things that they never dreamed they would do when they picked up the Book of Mormon. Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt. Orson Pratt was going to be probably been a college professor. Parley P. Pratt probably would have been a pamphleteer for whatever, but 
what a dynamic man, how it infused his life with meaning and hope and purpose. Well, that's repetitive. So I think it's, I mean, I don't know if everybody here is LDS or everybody believes, but um, I can say that my introduction to the Book of Mormon, I was very, very, I did it because a girlfriend was Mormon and she had the missionaries come over and I read it and I read it with, uh, you know, as a duty, but it rang so true. It rang so true. And I read it again and I knew it was true. I, I mean, I believe it was true. It's very hard to say, you know, we're expected to believe. It's not ours to know, but I absolutely believe it has been a force of positive for everybody, for anybody who reads it. Even the guys who did Book of Mormon, the play. Who knows? I've got a copy of a letter that I'd like to share with everybody here that would like this copy that David Whitmer wrote in Richmond in 1887. Thank you. He said, I did see the angel as it is recorded in the book of my testimony in the Book of Mormon. The book is true. The gathering to Jackson County, Missouri, I think they were too hasty. I will send you my pamphlet as soon as it is printed. I have a copy of that pamphlet too, but for anybody that would like a copy of this letter, I think it's wonderful. So Thank if you, you come back and see us afterwards. Could you touch a little bit on, there was some background when we were back at the Grand and Press on the paper arriving back there and the quantity, where it came from and the special, along with the printing, and that was I very know interesting. That, uh, uh, some talk about uh, the miracle of pages of uh, stacks of paper appro uh, appearing at um, the back door mysteriously. Uh, I can only say that Rick and I looked into this, and um, uh, I'll say this kind of cheeky. We avoided the question. But getting paper was a problem, and they were able to get paper in a variety of ways. As far as the, the mysterious paper being dropped off, I, we can't confirm, how do they say it? We can't confirm or deny that story. That's what they say. What other information can you give us about Mary Whitmer? I've never heard the story before and it really touched me. Uh, you heard everything I know about Mary Whitmer. But Ann Leahy, apparently knows about her. <laughs> there is a film called The Fourth Witness. It was produced in 1997. It's a short film. I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Ann Leahy comes into the library all the time. She will, she is an incredible source of all sorts of important and trivial matters. I say that with love and appreciation. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the angel Moroni obviously was huge in bringing forth the Book of Mormon, but should but did he do more and get more credit than he actually has? Oh gosh, how can I say that? How can I answer that? Uh, our book starts out with an account of uh, the ancient days, and whew, man, if this was a class, I'd say somebody want to take this. Um, I don't think he's given too much credit. I think, um, matter of fact, uh, he is there throughout Joseph Smith's experience, guiding, teaching, um, chewing him out. Um, remember Joseph had to Joseph had to learn a lot of things. And you know, one thing to consider about Joseph, and this is not directly an answer because I I'm not going to tackle that. Um, Joseph had nobody to use as an example. Joseph was on his own except for Moroni and those who gathered around him. There's nobody to teach him how to start a church. There's nobody to teach him how to um, receive revelation. Uh, he's, he's, I won't say he's inventing, he's learning along the way. You know, he was a, ma a man of the frontier. And so, you know, it's kind of like building a log cabin. They, they did it. They learned how to do it. They figured out how to do it. And I think there was that spirit in that time of, well, 
I've been given this task, I'm going to do it. Uh, Moroni is not overcredited. Um, he is on top of the temple, so he must be pretty important. Yes, sir. Just a comment about the location of the box on the Hill Cumorah. My wife yep. and I spent a year and a half there as tour guides. Uh, that location is as described on the west side of the hill near the top. And if you can find that over the sides of that hill, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> One other comment. Uh, as we served there at the Hill Cumorah area, we had some report that said that Moroni and Joseph visited at least 30 different times. They were very well acquainted with each other. Thank you. Boyd? Bill, I have a question for you as a photo archivist. Uh, are there, do you know of any uh, possibility that there were photographs of the Prophet Joseph Smith taken? Oh, boy. The possibility is great. But we don't have any. Um, well, that's what he, yeah. Um, uh, let's put, the possibilities are very good that he had a daguerreotype taken of him. He was in places where there were daguerreotype shops at certain given times. Number two, he was a man who was very curious about life and would have been interested in this. Um, daguerreotypes were invented or given to the, were, yeah, invented, I'll just say, in 1839. So he had a short period, and it was in France. He had a short period, but it, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. had daguerreotype shops. And then right towards the end of Joseph's life, uh, there was a uh, daguerreotype shop opening in Nauvoo. But we don't know. He does talk about sitting for his likeness, which is a loose term. You could say that about a painting, about a drawing. Um, what I can tell you is we don't. There isn't one in that we know of, and we've looked at all sorts of possibilities, and uh, it hasn't appeared yet. But you know, things things come up, and we're hopeful that it will. Um, he's not going to look like Brad Pitt. He's he's probably going to be fairly plain looking, uh, and, and Rick Turley likes to say that uh, he points out that. Many people will probably be disappointed. Um, those who liked Joseph, those who appreciated Joseph, found him to be a handsome man. Those who disliked Joseph thought he was ugly and plain. So I find that kind of interesting. Um, I read a talk that I believe was from conference in 1997, and I wish I, I can't remember who was the speaker. But he was, he was sharing some incredible stories about the translation of the Book of Mormon. And one of them was that um, as Joseph Smith was translating, he came to the part where it talks about the walls of Jerusalem. And he, Emma was writing for him at the time. And he looked up and he goes, Emma, did Jerusalem have walls? You know, I mean, he was so uneducated. He had no idea. And to me, that's such a testimony of you know, who he was and that this was through the power of God that he was translating the Book of Mormon. He, we owe so much to him. I don't know how he ever went through what he did. And Emma, too, she doesn't get the credit that she should have either. I agree. I agree. And as Jack Welsh, uh, who I quoted, points out very strongly, I mean, this was, what, 65 days? I, you know, I know that uh, with the books I've published, it, well, the fact that I'm always late for the deadline doesn't matter, but... You know, you go through, you edit yourself, then they go through it and edit it, then you approve their editing and edit it some more, and then it's published, and then you find all the mistakes as some friends have found in their newly published book, and so it is amazing. This is amazing, and, and as Jack states, there are no, uh, there's no libraries to check, no internet to go look it up. Um, I think it's a pretty compelling story. Either that or he had an incredible imagination in it, and uh, I think it's an imagination novelist would, uh, would pretty much like to have. Yes, ma'am. Is it true the stories that I've heard that he would translate, break for lunch, come back and start right at this spot, 
not have to go back. I think that's a wonderful that's, testimony. From our study, that is correct. That is correct. And I don't know about you, you all, but uh, it takes me, t when I'm writing something, it takes me a long time to warm up to where I was and to just pick up. And frankly, from day to day, I don't think anybody who's written here has ever had not having a day when you can't even think how to write the, the comes out hard. Uh, and then you go back and read it and you go, okay, that was not a good day. So pretty incredible. And, and, to, and I think to, to have finished it that quickly, yeah, he had, to, he had to be right on it. Imagine it was exhausting. Thank you for coming out. Thank you to April. We appreciate you coming. Thanks. Thank you.